Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Making Michigan, the Bentley Library series on the history of the University of Michigan. I'm Andrew Rutledge. I'm a Bentley historian and research associate, and I'm pleased to welcome you all to the, uh, the historic Detroit Observatory this evening, a division of the Bentley. And I also want to welcome our YouTube audience who are watching from home, restaurants, or places maybe a little more comfortable in this room this evening. Thank you all for joining us. And tonight, we have a very exciting, and considering both the pandemic that's really upended so many lives over the last couple of years, and the fact we're in the midst of the flu season right now, timely presentation. Our speaker this evening is Joel Howell, who is joining us to talk about the remarkable history of U of M's medical school and its first hospital. Joel is a faculty member at the medical school, as well as in our Department of History. He's the author of a wonderful little book on bike rides around Ann Arbor, as well as numerous works on the history of medicine. In particular, as part of the medical school's bicentennial, Joel and Dia Boster published a really wonderful little book that I have to confess right now, I left on my desk in the Bentley or else I'd be waving it around talking about how great it is, uh, entitled Medicine at Michigan, a history of the University of Michigan Medical School at the Bicentennial. Now, my own academic background is in early modern history. I'm not a historian of medicine, at least anything after 1800. But I freely confess that I found this book absolutely fascinating. Because as someone who has spent the last half decade writing and thinking about the University of Michigan's history and its relationship both to the state and to society as a whole, this book is full of really thought-provoking episodes and analyses. And I'm sure those of you that work in healthcare or in public health would probably get a heck of a lot more of it out of it than I did. For in many ways, it is not just a book about a particular program or even a particular institution. It's about the evolution of medical education and the place of the university in the world. Joel Howell, who's joining us, is the Elizabeth Ferrand Collegiate Professor of the History of Medicine at the University of Michigan, where he has worn many hats as a faculty member in the departments of history, internal medicine, and health management and policy. After receiving his bachelor's degree just up the road at Michigan State University, he earned an MD from the University of Chicago, and then a PhD in the history and sociology of science at the University of Pennsylvania. Combining all these experiences, his historical research attempts to understand when, and maybe more importantly, why, we as a society became convinced that the key to better medicine comes through technology and science. And this is a subject he hasn't just explored in regards to the United States, but he's also worked on projects in Brazil and Ethiopia as well. Additionally, he is the founding director of the Medical Arts Program, which offers opportunities for medical students and residents to attend art events and meet with artists, as well as to create art themselves. And finally, I have to say from our conversations, he's just really a wonderful storyteller. I think you're all in for a treat tonight. So please join me in welcoming Joel Howell. Thank you, Thank you very much. I uh, hope to tell a few stories. Um, you mentioned the flu season. I will briefly put on my role as a physician and say I hope everybody in this room has had their flu shot. If you haven't, please get it. Um, it will help you. Uh, and so hello to everybody uh, around the world and those that are watching this asynchronously. If you're watching this 10 years from now, I don't know what the world will be like then. It'll be interesting. But we're gonna look backwards. We're gonna, yeah, we're gonna, we wanna switch this over if we could. I don't know exactly how we do that. It's highly technical. All right, so let's, we're gonna go back Oh, a little over 150 years ago. And some very strange things happened, very interesting things that continue to resonate today. Some decisions were made. Decisions that shaped the way that we teach medicine and the way we practice medicine and the people we choose to have as our physicians. Now these kinds of radical innovations, and I'm gonna to try to convince you that they were in fact radical, uh, you know, it might have happened in Philadelphia. Uh, University of Pennsylvania would be a, a, a good place to think of as doing innovative work in the city of 121,000 people. Or maybe even at Harvard, which uh, was known then and is still known now as an exceptional in educational institution. In Boston, 136,000 people. Or maybe Columbia. In New York City, uh, half a million people and growing fast. But no, it was here in Ann Arbor, Michigan, 
in a sleepy little town of 3,000 people out on the western edge of the frontier, that people made a couple of decisions. One was that the medical school ought to admit women, ought to allow women to become physicians. And the second is that the local university should own and operate its own hospital. And these two changes, I think one could argue, have then spread all over the country. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how they started here. Um, there are places and institutions that tend to overvalue their history uh, with respect to any listeners who may have gone to medical school at Johns Hopkins University. Everything important in the history of medicine didn't, actually did not happen at Johns Hopkins, <laughs> although many important things did. Um, Michigan, in a strange way, I think t tends to undervalue its importance in the history of medicine, and I'll tell you a little bit about why. Well, to start with, we're going to go back to where before the state of Michigan is a state. And you really can't have a university hospital unless you have a university. And in 1817, a small school called the Catholepistemiad uh, opened in Detroit. And uh, its relationship to the University of Michigan, I think, is actually more tenuous than you might think. But um, we have chosen as a university um, to elect that as the year which, when the university started. In 1837, Michigan became a state. And the state legislature said, we need a university. We're going to establish a university, and we're going to put it in Ann Arbor. An interesting decision. Why Ann Arbor? Probably because it was on the rail line. Uh, and that made it a very convenient place to be. But more than that, they made a, another prescient decision. They said, this university is going to have a medical school. Now, why in 1837, a brand new state out of the frontier should decide that a priority is to have a medical school is very strange. We'll go into it in a little more detail in a second. Most physicians in the United States had never been to medical school. Most physicians had never even seen a hospital. So why this frontier town thinks that it needs a hospital is interesting, but they did. University opens in 1841. Uh, brief side note, it reports to a board of regents rather than to the legislature, which has given us over the years, a good deal more flexibility and freedom than other state universities that report to the legislature. Uh, 1848, the medical faculty is formed. And in 1850, the medical school opens. And this is the first medical school building. This is an early announcement for the University of Michigan. I'll point out a couple of things here. First of all, um, professors at the University of Michigan Medical School we're also professors at the university. So this medical school has been and continues to be an integral part of the university. This was unusual, even for highly reputable schools like Harvard or Columbia. You could be in the medical school and not be in the university. Second, I just commented briefly about the railroad. Um, I'm, I guess one of the many fascinating parts of medical history is in history in general is trans the importance of transportation. So I'll just make a side point that whoever wrote this made a choice. And they made a choice in the first sentence to point out that they were on the railroad. So obviously, they thought, they thought it was important. And I think it was important, too. Campus looked quite a bit different. This is a painting by Jacob Francis Crosby, a member of the Hudson River School, known for his lavish use of color. Uh, we have few, less livestock around the campus now than we used to. Um, there being no lawnmowers, the grass was left to grow unencumbered, and you see students out there wearing the traditional tall hats. But to consider what happens next, we need to dive a little more deeply into the context of medical education. If you wanted to be a doctor, you apprenticed. You found somebody who was a doctor, and you followed him around, and it was almost always him. And you carried the instruments, and you washed up after the surgeries, and you learned. And if it was a good doctor, you learned a lot. And you apprenticed. And when you thought you'd learned enough, you went out into practice and you hung out your shingle. There were no licensure laws. You didn't have to pass a test or be certified by the state to be a doctor. So this is how most people got their education. So when I, that's what I meant when I said most medical doctors had never seen a medical school or a hospital. The University of Michigan 
here are some students. It was, it was a little bit rowdier. This was, one, this was early medical students at the University of Michigan. Uh, you see the skeleton off to one side. You see the bottle of alcohol up there in the foreground. Uh, I will just make a brief note to our hosts and uh, mentors. Um, much of what I'm going to show you comes from the Bentley, <laughs> which is a wonderful, wonderful library. And if you've never been up there, you should go. Um, students were a bit rowdier. Things were a bit looser. This, let's take a look here. These are the announcements of the University of Michigan. And we'll focus in on the rules at the bottom, uh, particularly Number four, students are expected to maintain order and to avoid all rough sport, the throwing of missiles, et cetera. Um, well, if they're having to put this in the rules of the medical school, this suggests that people were actually throwing stuff around during lectures. Um, fortunately, it, it hasn't happened lately. Um, here we see another picture of our friendly medical students. Um, the monkey, I believe, is an allusion to the recently promulgated theory of evolution of Mr. Darwin. They're making fun of it. I have no idea what the dead cow and shotgun are doing at the side. <laughs> but they're there. Clues students would wake up the other ones. It was, it was two years. It wasn't graded, not A, B, C, D, but the, the, the second year lectures were identical to the first. So you sat through two years of lectures. And it was a tradition that the second year students would wake up the first year students when there was a good joke coming, so they wouldn't miss it. They did teach anatomy. There's a story here, how they got the bodies. A demonstrator who retired remembered that he, quote, found himself authorized and required by the great state of Michigan to buy, steal, or in any other manner procure subjects for dissection. The situation was a difficult one, and I shall not go into details. But suffice it to say that I supplied the university, instructed in the dissecting room, and was chased by the constable, but did not reside in the governmental palace in Jackson. Jackson was and continues to be the site of the state penitentiary. And he did this because he never took any bodies in Ann Arbor. What was he doing? He was, he was grave robbing. He was getting bodies from the medical school by, gra by robbing graves. Uh, on one occasion, they were not so careful, and the townspeople got wind of it and threatened to burn down the medical school. And the medical students were called out to, ar to arm themselves and patrol the medical campus until things calmed down. Uh, they did not actually succeed in burning down the medical school. Money was a little different. Students paid five bucks a year. Medical faculty didn't get that much. Um, it was hard to make a living as a doctor. There weren't that many people in Ann Arbor. And Moses Gunn uh, was an early faculty member and later the dean who commuted back and forth from Detroit on the train. And he would occasionally be seen running out of class early because he had to get the train back to Detroit. So the school was categorized by many as a country medical school. And people said, you're never going to make it in Ann Arbor. You need to move to the big city as early as 1856 was the first proposal made that we should just move the medical school to Detroit. Um, it, it did not succeed. It was not the last either. Um, students did occasionally have the opportunity to see patients in hospitals in Detroit, but there were a lot of problems. It was contingent on the goodwill of the hospital, who would agree to let students in. Sometimes students wouldn't be allowed to see certain patients. A medical school professor, just because you were a professor in the medical school, didn't mean you could go into the hospital. Uh, and if you thought clinical instruction was a good thing, this was clearly a suboptimal situation. Now, recall that most students had already done clinical training. They'd already rounded with the preceptor. So maybe it wasn't that important that the medical schools didn't teach clinical medicine. Uh, but people debated this point. And in fact, there was a memo to the regents in 1860 that said the successful practice of the healing art involves this, that skill and dexterity, that power to perceive, to know, to discriminate, which can only be acquired by experience and observation at the bedside of the patient. The good physician must possess not only the science, but the art of medicine. So a couple of important points here, probably more than two. Um, the art of medicine. We talk about this today. 
It is not sufficient to simply know all the facts, know about interleukin one, two, three, and four. I'm not sure how many there are. Um, you also need to be able to take care of people, to take care of patients. That's the art of medicine. The other point is that some of this can only be acquired by going to the bedside and learning at the bedside. And this came up to the Board of Regents. And the Regents said, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm paraphrasing. Um, they said, well, you know, we got a law school. It's a pretty good law school. We don't run a court. We got a pretty good engineering school. We don't run a railroad. Why should the medical school run a hospital? But the argument was maintained, and the decision was made that we, in fact, ought to run a hospital. And in 1869, on North University Avenue, a former professor's home was converted uh, to a hospital. A two-story home, four rooms, 20 patient beds. This was fairly typical for many hospitals, converted, patient, converted houses. And this was the first hospital to be owned and operated by a university in the United States. Uh, since then, virtually every medical school has either acquired contact with a hospital or runs its own. Uh, in this way, I think we really do need to, in a sense, pat ourselves on the back as, be, as being the forerunner. There is a priority debate which is ultimately uh, very uninteresting. Uh, University of Pennsylvania also claims this honor. Uh, in 18, and I say this as an alumnus of the University of Pennsylvania as well. In 1870, they opened a hospital that they had built. So they were the first university hospital, university to build a hospital. Um, fine, we'll both, we'll both. <laughs> um, the point is that, that this, was, this was new and radical. Now, why? We built this to serve one of the two primary purposes of the university. This is a university hospital, it is a university medical school. Universities exist to teach, and do research. And this hospital was designed to provide teaching. There was no charge. You were a citizen of the state of Michigan, you got care at the university hospital. The physical proximity to the university was important. Um, not least because there was no operating room. So the operations were done in the lecture halls of the medical buildings and the patients were carried across campus back to the hospital. Not terribly sanitary. Uh, there was a homeopathic hospital, uh, and for many years the university ran a homeopathic medical school as well. So the second major change I want to mention is shown here. This is the medical school class of 1885. And you may notice that at the back there, there are some women. The first woman to go to medical school in the United States was probably uh, Elizabeth Blackwell in 1849 at Geneva Medical College. Um, Geneva Medical College wasn't thought to be a, a elite prestigious medical school uh, the, even then, and it closed soon thereafter. Uh, she wasn't admitted as part of a policy discussion about whether or not women should be admitted to medical school. She was kind of admitted as a one-off. Um, she went on to a wonderful career, and I don't mean to diminish her career in the slightest. I just want to point out this, 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 didn't, this wasn't the kind of a policy change that really made a difference. There were medical schools for women that, off, that opened thereafter, the Women's Medical College of Pennsylvania in 1850. And let's think for a moment about what this debate was all about. Why should you care? Well, one of the reasons is that if women became doctors, it would take them out of the home, which was their most important role. It would keep the home pure. What about modesty? Um, on the other hand, women are nurses, and they take, nurses take care of unclad bodies of all types, and men take care of women. But still, it was considered to be a problem. Other problems, um, and these are misogynistic stereotypes, but they're real, that women uh, simply weren't that bright, couldn't do difficult decisions. They were deficient in judgment and courage. They were impulsive and irrational. But perhaps the most serious argument uh, was made in part, and this is, this is a book by E.H. Clark, Sex and Education, A Fair Chance for the Girls. Uh, he was a Harvard professor. Harvard keeps coming up a lot, I guess. Uh, and the argument basically was that uh, menstruation made women unfit. 
that um, they're out for a week, a month. So we're training physicians who can't work for a week, a month. They need rest to counteract the loss of blood. Uh, and thus, um, it's a bad use of resources to admit women. Uh, the Boylston Prize essay a few years later went to Mary Putnam Jacoby for this book, The Question of Rest for Women During Menstruation, in which she did a wonderful statistical analysis, data here in the United States and elsewhere, uh, showing that women, in fact, uh, did just fine. Other arguments, uh, pro and con, um, maybe women are different. Maybe women bring a, a sensitivity. Um, you know, Regina Sanchez, a professor of history here at the University of Michigan, wrote a wonderful, wonderful book called Sympathy and Science, the two things that women brought. Um, people were concerned that going into medicine would masculinize women, make them more like men. This was a bad thing. But in any event, the University of Michigan decided that they would change the rules in 1870. The Board of Regents recognized the right of every resident of Michigan to the enjoyment of the privileges afforded by the university, and they will admit anyone with the requisite literary and moral qualifications. Didn't say specifically women, didn't say specifically African American people, we'll get to that in a second. The reaction to the resolution was predictable. The New York Times said the University of Michigan is young and vigorous and second to none in the land. The Ann Arbor Argus said men should enroll elsewhere because women are going to be asking for courses in basket weaving. <laughs> Note which newspaper has survived. <laughs> <laughs> um, they did fine. Uh, Kara Morench is a student who worked with me a number of years ago that actually went to the Bentley and pulled up the grades and showed that the women in the early classes actually did a little bit better than the men in terms of their grades, including grades given by medical school professors who were opposed to admitting women. Uh, they were not treated the same. You can't see in this picture on the aisle on the right-hand side, there is a red line. And the women were on one side of the red line and the men were on the other. And if they tried to cross over the red line, they would be driven back, driven back with chance of red line, red line, red line. Um, I don't, the pointer is not working great, I don't think, or at all, there's, so I can't point. If you look up uh, in the top row, there's a gentleman who appear, looks like he could be African American. We're going to come back to African American students. He was allowed to sit, evidently, in, in with the men. Um, anatomy, always an issue. I mean, it's, you know, you, you, you all can understand this. It's just, it's just embarrassing to have to talk about anatomy and in mixed company. So the women, of course, had to have their own classes in anatomy, which the faculty didn't, didn't object to in part because they were paid extra. Um, so they were taught. So, so women were admitted. They were not treated the same. They did have a sense of humor about it. I, people like to play with skeletons. This is an early uh, woman medical student at the University of Michigan with a posed picture with her skeleton. Uh, shown in the back here are the women on the steps. The first graduate was Amanda Sanford, graduated with highest honors, probably the first woman to graduate from the university as a whole. By 1900, uh, we had graduated nearly 400 women, perhaps the most of any coeducational school in the United States. Meanwhile, the women's medical colleges are closing. That's another story in and of itself. And now the medical school class ha is and has been for a while. 50% or slightly more female. University of Michigan was the first place, the first major American medical school to admit women. I think we can feel good about that. Alice Hamilton, uh, a prominent uh, early graduate, the first woman at Harvard on the faculty. It's not entirely clear the demographics and the status for people of color. Uh, it's not, the records weren't kept in those ways. The first African American to graduate, although unfortunately not the first to enroll, as we'll get to in a moment, was W. Henry Fitzbutler, uh, who was the son of an enslaved uh, person and uh, graduated in 1873. Uh, he moved to Kentucky, where he was an outspoken advocate for, the, for doing away with racial discrimination. I can, only imagine what it was like to be a black person in Kentucky in the 1880s 
uh, making that kind of an argument. But I'm sorry to tell you that he was not the first African-American person to enroll at the University of Michigan Medical School. Uh, alas, structural racism has been part of US history since about 1619. And medicine is not immune, nor is the University of Michigan. First, first African-American actually to enroll at the University of Michigan was a gentleman named Alpheus Tucker. And for this research, I'm going to give a tip of the hat to the scholars at the Clements Library who did some wonderful archival research to come up with the story I'm about to tell. Uh, Tucker was born in Detroit. Uh, he attended school at Oberlin, so unlike many people at the time, he went to college. Uh, he decided he wanted to be a physician, so he applied to the medical school in his home state at the University of Michigan, and in 1863, enrolled at the University of Michigan Medical School. 1863, in the middle of the Civil War, in the middle of a war that was being fought over whether or not slavery would continue to be a part of these United States. And I wish I could tell you that he was welcomed by the class here. He was not. The students drove him out. They jeered at him. They threw things at him. The faculty did not back him up. They supported the students, and he left. Here you see the admission ledger for 1863. You do not see Alpheus's Tucker name, Tucker's name. That's because after he was forced out, his name was erased, and another student's name was written in over it. So we talk about people being erased from the pages of history. He was literally erased from the pages of history. As he wrote, he was denied admittance because from an accident of birth, I am a shade or two darker than my fellow students. He said students were supported by a faculty member. He wrote that a Negro-hating faculty will soon make Negro-hating students. He finished his degree elsewhere, Georgetown, served in the Civil War, had a successful career in Washington, DC. So this, I think, is an important story for us as we pat ourselves on the back for the wonderful things the University of Michigan has done over the years that we have not always behaved in ways that I think we can be proud of. Going back to the hospital, it was a small hospital. Uh, it soon needed more space. They added on to the existing university hospital. Here are some of the floor plans. You can see in the background there the pavilion hospital. And we'll take a, another look at it. Uh, you see students out front wearing their traditional top hats, as usual. Uh, this had 60 beds. And interestingly, it was funded uh, not only by the state legislature, as well as the city of Ann Arbor. 8,000 bucks from the state legislature, 4,000 bucks from the city. Hmm. Um, the homeopathic hospital operating room was built in 1879. It was the first hospital to have an operating room. Uh, the Catherine Street, Street Hospital in 1891. Uh, the president of the university wanted the hospital to be far away from the university because he was afraid of contamination. Uh, the faculty wanted to stay close. They said it's useful to have connections with the university. Um, so this emphasizes not for the last time the importance of connections with the university. Uh, this hospital was funded with $50,000 from the legislature and $25,000 from the city. This is the last time that I'm aware that the city of Ann Arbor uh, offered money to support the building of the university hospital. Small town. What are we going to do? Not that many patients here. We're gonna, we we want to build a hospital. So what are we, maybe we should Maybe we should move the whole damn thing to Detroit. Remember, this was brought up earlier. It was brought up again. Detroit, Ann Arbor was, was a small, sleepy little village. Detroit was a boom town. It had gone from 286,000 people to 466,000 people. The Erie Canal had opened up transportation uh, between Detroit and the East Coast. The automobile industry was just about to get going and make it a, a, you know, a boom for a whole new other set of industries. And for a first-class medical school, the argument was you needed adequate patients for clinical instruction. And the proposal to move the medical school and the hospital to Detroit split the faculty, and not in a very nice way. The ophthalmology chair, George Frothingham, in 1889 went to the state legislature to argue against funds for a new hospital in Ann Arbor. 
He claimed that, quote, it was just as reasonable to raise oranges in Canada as to maintain a complete clinic in Ann Arbor. In other words, it made no sense at all to have a big hospital here in Ann Arbor, like raising oranges in Canada. Think about what it means. He's a faculty member at the university who's going to the legislature to argue against the legislature giving the university money. Uh, people noticed. Um, here are some headlines um, that came up. Uh, the lively debate in the newspapers. The Ann Arbor Argus said there's no reason why he should remain in the employee of the university which he defies, or even live longer in the city in which he damns. Uh, racially charged language on the warpath again, a professor's scalp knife. Um, this was wars with Native Americans were still going on. So this, this, this kind of racial comment was not totally out of character, a professor's defiance. And in fact, he did not keep his job and he went to move to Detroit and became president of the Michigan State Medical Association and the University Hospital stayed in Ann Arbor. The hospital had open wards that looked something like this. It was an open design. It emphasized the therapeutic value of ventilation and fresh air. Uh, it was a favorite of the pioneering nurse, uh, Florence Nightingale, because it offered clear sight lines a nurse sitting in the middle could easily see patients all throughout the hospital. It also offered patients a chance to get to know one another. Patients stayed in the hospital for weeks, for months. And nowadays they stay for days or hours. But this changes nationally as well as here. One of the things that changes is the hospital goes from being a place to care for the poor to a place where the wealthy and the people of means would, go, would want to get their care. So this is the cover of a new journal called Hospital Management. Uh, you'll note from the dates that it's relatively new, uh, which tells you that people are now thinking about hospital management, and it shows lines encouraging well-to-do people, well-dressed people, um, to come and enter the hospital. Other professional groups became important for the hospitals. Uh, nursing used to be provided by Patients who had stayed a long time, then nursing became professionalized. University of Michigan opened a nursing school in 1891. Now one of the hot new educational innovations we have here is interprofessional education. So I'm teaching a graduate class right now that has both physicians and nurses in it. The idea is that we, are, we, we work together, we should train together, we should learn together. Hospitals became much more systematically organized. This is another cartoon from hospital management. I obviously love this journal as a source. Um, and it shows different departments sitting around the table discussing what's going to happen. It's no longer the university hospital on North University with 20 beds, but it's a big organized bureaucratic affair. Uh, labor starts to become an issue. Uh, you see, here we see nurses shown stopping to punch the clock, and he says, hurry, hurry, there's an emergency. Well, they've got to stop and check in first. Uh, and money starts to become an issue. Rather than simply being a charity affair, good cost accounting stops you from going bankrupt. Again, from hospital management, the bridge to becoming solvent is there with the accountants. Catherine Street Hospital grew, became overcrowded. Meanwhile, the education provided by the University Medical School is changing. Uh, we have more and more. This is another picture from the Bentley, of course. Most of, many of the pictures I'm showing are from the Bentley. Um, laboratory instruction starts to become important. Why? The notion that knowledge changes, that facts change. People used to be sent to read Hippocrates. I've looked at medical school notebooks uh, from the 1830s and 1840s. They're not sent to read Hippocrates because they want to learn Greek medicine. They're sent to read Hippocrates because Hippocrates can teach you how to take care of the patient better. But if you believe that knowledge is changing and facts are changing, then providing knowledge, producing knowledge in the laboratory based on science starts to become seen as valuable. Along with this comes the notion that journals are important. And in 1880, the University of Michigan decided to subscribe to every medical journal in the world. 
And for that reason, our library is a wonderful resource for historians who come visit us from all over. Because, you know, if you want, if, from 1891, some obscure journal that only existed for three years, uh, we've got it. You can look at it. Um, in the meantime, on the one hand, science is becoming ascendant in laboratory instruction. Laboratory instruction is expensive. On the other hand, remember I mentioned there, was no, there were no state licenses? Uh, states start to adopt licensure laws. In other words, if you want to be a doctor, you, get, you need to go to medical, you need to get a license, and often one of the criteria for getting a license is to uh, go to medical school, get a degree. So you have a proliferation of so-called proprietary medical schools because there's no, there's no standards. I mean, I can find a couple of buds, rent out a couple of classrooms and say I'm a medical school and, and give out diplomas if you pay your tuition. People were concerned that many of these medical schools were not so good, and this led to this report, which some of you may have heard of, so-called Flexner Report on Medical Education in the United States and Canada. So we'll pause for a moment here uh, and look at this in a little more detail. Um, first of all, Abraham Flexner was not a physician. He was a school teacher in Louisville. His brother, Simon Flexner, was a prominent physician who was an early researcher at the Rockefeller Institute in New York City. You will occasionally see them confused or see one person's portrait where it should be another person. Um, it was the Carnegie Foundation that supported this. Uh, Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching, industry growing, steel industry growing, the notion that if you made a lot of money, you owed it to use some of that money to give back to your community, so the rise of foundations. Uh, the Carnegie Foundation had, in their previous work, gone around to secondary schools and funded retirement funds for uh, school teachers. And so, undoubtedly, when they started going around to all the medical schools, uh, the medical schools were hoping that this was that they were going to give them money for their retirement funds. So Flexner visited all the medical schools in the United States and wrote a report. Um, the report, I think, is arguably the most overrated book in the history of medicine, in that most of the changes that were taking place were taking place before he wrote the report. Uh, at least to what is, in my mind, a fascinating question, which is what, are the, what is the role of reports? We all look at reports. What does it mean? I mean, if you write a truly revolutionary, innovative, forward-looking, path-breaking, groundbreaking report, Nobody's going to read it. It's too, it's, it, you know, nobody, you're not going to sell people. You, reports follow on things that we already believe, but that's perhaps something for the discussion. Um, I just wanted to show you what he had to say about Michigan. Uh, Michigan had, at that point, two million plus people, five medical colleges. Just to show you that he did not write positively about everything, this is his report on the Detroit Homeopathic College. And there are many similar kinds of reports. Um, you know, the laboratory facilities. He starts with laboratory facilities because science is important. They're wretched, uh, et cetera, et cetera. This is what he had to say about Ann Arbor. He loved Ann Arbor. Ann Arbor was one of the few schools that he thought was absolutely first rate. Uh, notes the entrance requirement was two years of college work, strictly enforced. Our teaching staff was excellent, resources were excellent, excellently equipped laboratories, large library. I mentioned the importance of the library. Uh, the only criticism he had uh, really was that there weren't enough patients in Ann Arbor and that we really ought to move to Detroit. So that's just a theme that keeps coming back. Well, we didn't. And we built Old, old Main. How many people in this room have seen Old Main? All right. Let the record for those on, online reflect about over half the people in the room. Uh, and there's a clear age distribution. <laughs> because Old Main has been torn down for a while. It was opened up in 1925, uh, designed by Albert Kahn, who also designed factories. He designed the Ford Motor Company's River Rouge plant. He designed Hill Auditorium. Had 1,225 beds, triple the size of the Catherine Street Hospital. By far the largest publicly financed structure in the state. Um, 
It's about 450,000 square feet. Cost a lot of money. Um, some other pictures, just showing that it, 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 it was in a Y, it's uh, like this. And it was self-consciously part of the university. Here's the, here's the door, it's this university hospital. Now what does it mean to be a university hospital? It means that not only is teaching part of your mission, but so is the creation of knowledge. And we talk about having laboratories on site. What I think is interesting about this hospital is that it not only housed a laboratory, it was a laboratory. And then let me tell you what I mean by that. We did a little background here. Um, early electrocardiogram machines were taken with leads that looked like this. You see this is a gentleman that has his hands in buckets of saline, and the tracing at the bottom shows Eindhoven lead one. Never mind what that means. Here's another tracing where he's got a foot in there, but this, these were big, bulky machines. And the early machine, EKG machines were big, bulky machines. And a guy named Frank Wilson was studying the EKG at the University of Michigan. And he had a, in the new hospital, there was a heart station shown here. So it was a space specifically designed to take EKGs. But the way, reason I said the hospital itself was a laboratory is the entire hospital was wired so that in every room, there were wires that ran from the room down to what was called the heart station. Or in this case, I think it's labeled the galvanometer room. String galvanometer is another word for the EKG machine. So the hospital itself was designed to create information that could be used. Uh, and the research that was done was absolutely critical. He did fundamental research. Nowadays, when we take an electrocardiogram, and during the time I've been talking, we've probably taken a dozen electrocardiograms up at the hospital. Um, it's a 12-lead electrocardiogram. Nine of the 12 leads came directly or indirectly from work that was being done here. That's an enormous impact. Just as a brief aside, he also had a hobby. He liked to take pictures of birds, which he did with some fairly famous people. That's another story altogether. I am not a bird person, although I like these pictures. Um, these I would describe as fuzzy white birds. Uh, but I think it's, it's a good picture. And here's another picture. So for tracking the hospital over the years, uh, there are other hospitals that come into play. The, after the Second World War, the Veterans Administration uh, supports the building of hospitals, which play a major role uh, for medical education and patient care. And we have a hospital, it's the Ann Arbor VA. Here's another picture of the Ann Arbor VA. Another big change that affected hospitals in general, including ours, was the provision of federal funds to support uh, patient care. And there's an Ann Arbor linkage as well. Uh, this is uh, JFK. Uh, and he's, he is standing on the steps of the Union. If you've not been to the Union, you can walk over there. It's about, what, about, it's about a 10 minute walk from here. You were there? Yes, yes. Then you know this was, this, he wasn't president. He was running for president. And it was about two in the morning because he was running late. Um, and what he, he discussed the, uh, the Peace Corps, which he wanted to found. And he pushed Medicare and health care for the elderly. Um, unfortunately, he was assassinated, as you are aware. Um, there's a saying that Kennedy was a show horse and Johnson was a workhorse. His Vice President Johnson, who was roundly hated by all the Kennedys, became president. Robert Caro has written a wonderful biography, of, a multi-volume biography of LBJ, who actually pushed through the Great Society, Medicare, Medicaid, plays a key role in the lives not only of everybody in this room who's over the age of 65, um, but also when we take care of patients at the hospital, the people are coming in with funding. And this was announced, of course, by Linda Mage Johnson, who was shown here in 1964 in the big house. Uh, my graduation. Was he a good, did he give a good speech? <laughs> all right. Do you remember this? Yeah, yeah all right. Some, let, let those on the remote audience reflect that somebody has ver verified who was there. <laughs> this. Um, old Main, show you a few pictures from what the old hospital looked like. This is what the wards looked like. People doing rounds. People doing laboratory work on the floor. 
We used to do gram stains and spin crits and do stuff like that on the floor in the laboratory as shown here. Here you see somebody getting, preparing to spin a hematocrit, that is to measure the amount of blood in a blood sample. You notice he's also pipetting by mouth, which is frowned upon. Uh, we used to have these things. These are called card catalogs for the younger members of the audience who might not be familiar with this somewhat antiquated technology. Um, I was actually in the National Library of Medicine the day they took out the card catalogs because they, 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 used some, they had to use some kind of solvent to get them off the, off the glue off the floor. And so we were run out of our conference room. We were having a meeting. But anyway, this, this is a card catalog. We used to have vertical filing cabinets to keep track of literature. Um, I had a filing cabinet and a half filled with papers that I had carefully curated and selected until I threw them all out because they're all available online. And finally, this wonderful piece of antiquarianism uh, known as a handwritten chart. <laughs> People, doctors used to sit and actually scrawl on pieces of paper to record your patient records. And finally, x-rays, x-ray viewers. Um, I mean, it's amazing. I, could pu I can pull up x-rays on this thing right here. Uh, here we see a doctor smoking a cigarette, looking at x-rays. <laughs> Cigarettes were pretty standard. Others sitting around the conference room having a cigarette. But Old Main eventually was falling apart. Uh, we decided we had to build a new hospital, and this shows the site of the new hospital. And you can see the Detroit Observatory in this picture. That's where we are. It's just a, so anybody needs to orient themselves to where Old Main was. Um, when the, host, when the old main came down, I took a few pictures. It's really, it was quite poignant. Because um, you look at these pictures, I mean, look at, look, look at each window. Think about what happened in that room that you're looking at. I mean, people lived, people died, people got wonderful news, people got horrible news. And, you know, the wrecking ball comes in and it just knocks it down. And eventually, we have the replacement hospital shown here in relationship to Old Main. And here we see what the complex looks like these days. 550 beds, cost 250 million bucks. It was the second most expensive project in the history of the state at that point, the most expensive, of course, being the Mackinac Bridge. Um, it's had a number of additions that uh, could be worth the discussions in and of themselves. Some people have noticed the mollification of hospitals. This is our cardiovascular center. Um, not, I mean, that's also a three minute walk from where we are right now, uh, where you can have a cup of coffee and sit in a very nice environment that kind of feels like being in a mall. Uh, and sometimes, sometimes the hospitals, in fact, have moved to the mall. So one of the characteristics is that the university hospital now has sites shown here in the Brighton Town Square. Uh, and we are busy purchasing practices all over the state. This is what we look like today. And of course, right behind us going up is the new uh, Pavilion Hospital. There are many, many more stories. This is the book that uh, was referred to earlier that I haven't had time to go into. I've, Briefly mention the homeopathic hospital. It's interesting that we ran a homeopathic medical school for many, many years. Uh, the tensions over the move to Detroit are far more longstanding and complicated than I've had time to talk about here. Um, the role of technology, fascinating to me. You know, the technology is played in the evolution of the medical school. Um, so I've talked about changes that have taken place over the years. I've talked about changes in the student body. Um, as I mentioned, over half the class is now women. Current educational system looks a lot like the old one in some ways. Uh, every medical school revises the curriculum periodically. We've revised ours quite a few times. Uh, but it's still, it's roughly four years. What's changed is the number of years of postgraduate training that people go to, which can be, be quite extensive. Um, the science-based nature of the field is magnified by the extramural federal funding. Uh, NIH funding has exploded since the Second World War. 
uh, and it plays a major role in the operation of the medical school. Uh, we've gone to a smaller group teaching, less lectures, more self-directed learning. Um, some of the continuity continues in perhaps an abated form. We no longer provide free care to all members, to all people of the state of Michigan, but we do provide uncompensated care, and we can discuss whether we provide enough uncompensated care, both we at the University of Michigan and we as in the U.S. healthcare system. But we still confront some of the same challenges. Who are our patients? Where do they come from? How do we take care of them? Who are our students? And how do we balance the many priorities and many goals of any hospital, particularly a university hospital at a state university, which is what we are? So that is a fairly rapid run through of a whole lot of years. And I would be happy to entertain questions. That, that was really fascinating and it's really impressive you managed to get through so much history in you know such a relatively like compact and clear time I'm, I'm really impressed um, but I want to actually be kind of unfair go back to the very beginning sure. of your talk for because you talked at the beginning about how uh, places like Johns Hopkins think all great medicine started and ended there but what was the influence of U of M with all these revolutions you've talked about on other medical schools? That's, that's an excellent question. And the influence comes in a variety of ways. I mean, one was serving as an exemplar. Um, the issue of women as physicians was in the air. It wasn't, we weren't, it wasn't that nobody had ever thought about it before. And so when a, what was perceived at the time as being a leading medical school, I mean, this didn't come out of nowhere, um, other medical schools decided that they ought to take the plunge and do the same thing. And frankly, some outdid us, including Johns Hopkins. I talked about how Michigan, at Michigan women were not admitted on the same basis as men. They had to sit on one side of the classroom. They took anatomy separately. When Johns Hopkins wanted to open a hospital, they were running short on money. And the daughter of the original magnate said she would give them the money they needed only if they agreed to admit women and treat them the same as men. So which, they were, in fact, the first medical school, as far as I'm aware, to, to admit women and treat them on the same, on the same basis as men. Um, the university hospital, the same kind of thing. Um, some, some places, Penn and others, built their hospitals. Others simply converted houses. That was fairly standard uh, in, into hospitals. But it was, it was a model. And if you're claiming that you can deliver superior medical education because you have clinical instruction, then you have uh, arguably a competitive advantage against other schools, and they want to be able to claim the same thing. Well, thinking also about that issue of clinical instruction, and you were also talking about sort of the rise of research, mm -hmm. um, were there debates within the medical school about the balance? You know, do, were there clinical physicians who were saying, what are you doing with all these laboratories? You're in the way of my patients? or? There were debates, there are debates, there continue to be debates. Um, I mean, which, which way to take it? I mean, one, one of the questions, do you, to be a medical school professor, do you have to do research? Now, I mean, do you, is, is, should that be a requirement or prerequisite? Should it be something that we expect? Um, and uh, some people would say yes, that if you're doing research, if you're expanding knowledge, if you're improving the health, I mean, one of the ways of thinking about research is if, I, if I'm a physician and I take care of a patient, I'm, I'm improving that patient's health. If I'm doing research, I'm potentially improving the health of many, many more people who will have the benefits of the research uh, that I've done. Um, when you've got limited resources, as you always do, um, and this is true even today, do you spend them on building new laboratories or on improving the clinical care? Here, Michigan had a real advantage. We were, were and are a state medical school. So these proprietary medical schools couldn't really open up laboratories. They didn't have the money. They were called proprietary because they were making their way on the basis of the tuition that their students were paying. We had a state legislature that was giving us money. Um, would, that it were, would that it was still like that. Um, and so we and other schools like us could not just hire people to run the laboratories, but buy the laboratory equipment. That stuff's expensive. 
sort of building off that question, and also since you brought in sort of the state legislature, um, could you tell us a little more about the homeopathic college, especially because it's my understanding that there's a lot of opposition to it at U of M, but the state legislature insisted we open one? So I didn't go into this, but in the 19th century, there are a variety of ideas of theoretical backgrounds for how medicine ought to be practiced. Um, allopathy is another term for what we now refer to as MD medicine. There's also osteopathy, which comes along a little bit later, uh, and we have quite a few osteopathic physicians in the state. Uh, homeopathy comes from a guy named Samuel Hahnemann in Germany. It was the notion that like cures like, and that medicine in very, very small quantities was effective. So if you were suffering from um, a fever, then you would be given some substance that would cause a fever, but you would be given in incredibly small dilutions. And I don't know, so, something like you know, a, one in, a 1 in 10 dilution followed by a 1 in 10 dilution followed by another 1 in 10 dilution followed by another 1 in 10 dilution. So that nowadays, you know, people have calculated the number of molecules of the original substance that would still be left, and the answer is very few. But it would somehow have the essence of what you needed to treat. Now, we would say this is potentially a placebo. We would say this doesn't do very much. Uh, another argument would be at least it doesn't hurt. Uh, I haven't gone into therapeutics at the time, but therapeutics at the time were dominated by things like bleeding. And we could talk about bleeding and why people thought bleeding was a good idea. Um, the father of our country, George Washington, was probably bled to death on his, on his sickbed. And by the way, the original records of that, of course, are located in the Clements Library, which is about a 10-minute walk that away. <laughs> um, so homeopathic medicine didn't hurt you. There was another part. Allopathic medicine had an East Coast tinge to it, had an, an elitist urban tinge to it. Homeopathic medicine was in, from the heartland. It, you know, and, and same thing with osteopathic medicine, which comes from out of Missouri. So the state legislature, for many years, insisted that they would not support the medical school here unless we also ran a homeopathic school side by side. And I, it's in the book. I think it's the 1930s. But don't, it's, you could look up. Uh, 1922, I think. 22, okay. Yeah. But for many years, they, the, the, the state legislature insisted that we run a homeopathic medical school at the, at the same time. And as I mentioned, the first operating room was in the homeopathic hospital. Uh, we, didn't, we never had an osteopathic school, um, which is another interesting uh, form of medicine. We still have osteopathic schools, and um, you know, I've written about the differences, if any, between I mean, osteopathic medicine and, and allopathic medicine uh, started off rather far apart in the theobetical background. Now, if you're an osteopathic physician, you can be licensed in, a, in any state in the union uh, plus the military, you can go do residencies and anything you want. The only question that remains is, is there anything different about being an osteopathic physician than being an allopathic physician? That's a longer discussion. Homeopathic medicine uh, is, is not licensed as physicians anywhere. Okay. And turning to sort of the students uh, who are at the homeopathic school or the medical school, um, I came across this wonderful anecdote um, from Harvard in the 1870s when I was preparing for tonight about a faculty member compla complaining about the idea of written exams because more than half of his students were illiterate. So uh, my question is, particularly in the 19th century, where were U of M's medical students? What was their background like? Where are they coming from? Uh, that's, that's an excellent anecdote, and, and, and I didn't get into that, but yeah. They were coming from the same place, and, and I didn't talk about this, but, but you didn't have to go to college. You didn't even have to graduate from high school to get into medical school. And so, but the fact that there were so many of them were illiterate at Harvard, I'm sure it was similar here at, at Michigan. Uh, it simply wasn't, the educational system was not as robust as we now have come to, to expect it to be. So, and that, you know, the, the pictures I showed you of the, the guys sitting around, think about those pictures to realize that that's how they want it to be seen. You know, when, when they put the bottle of alcohol in front of them or put the dead cow with the shotgun in the picture, that's not that they forgot to move it out of the way. <laughs> Uh, cameras were slower at taking pictures. They, they wanted all of that <laughs> in the picture. And that was more, and, and the fact, as I showed you, that you've got to have a rule in the books that says don't throw things at your professors. <laughs> uh, 
suggests that it wasn't the same highfalutin uh, elitist medical student uh, selection that we now have. It's very hard to get into medical school at the University of Michigan. Um, I forget the exact numbers, but it's pretty, we're extremely selective. Okay. And you do have to be able to read and write. <laughs> oh, good. I'm, I'm glad we cleared that up. Um, one group in particular I'm curious in learning a little more about is uh, African-American medical students. Um, you, know, you told us about what happened with Alpheus Tucker, but what about those who came after him? What were their, can you tell us a little more about their experiences? Were they, and considering I would imagine that the hospital patients were probably overwhelmingly white at that period, uh, did they, you know, were they <coughs> able to do rounds in the hospital or did they face discrimination there? Uh, yes and yes. Um, unsurprisingly, um, American society is not absent from the wards of the hospital, and so African American students had issues and still, I think, you know, experience treatment that is, that is uh, unfortunate and it should not be that way. But certainly that was the, that was the case early, earlier on. Yeah, in the book, we have some, some quotations uh, from the 60s and 70s from faculty and students about, uh, of color about just how horrible the environment was. So. Well, one final question I have, and then I'll open it up to everybody else so I can shut up, um, is you talked about sort of the seems kind of mixed feelings towards the medical school and the hospital among Ann Arborites. You have, on one hand, they're trying to burn it down because we're stealing bodies for, auto, for you know, Gr Grave robbing is usually frowned upon. Great, usually. Um, at the same time, they're paying you know, a third of the price for the new hospital. Uh, so could you tell us a little more about what that relationship was like? Were most of the patients at the hospital Ann Arborites? Or? Most were, were from Michigan. They weren't necessarily from Ann Arbor. Remember, Ann Arbor only has 3,000 people when they start. There aren't that many people to draw from. Um, it's always been a fraught and interesting relationship. Um, the university hospital is an enormous economic boon. The university is an enormous economic boon, and the university hospital and the medical school are, well, what were we, 40, 50 percent of the university at this point? Something like that. Something like that. Which is why many, many medical schools have thought about whether or not they ought to still be part of the university, and some outstanding medical schools, they've severed it, the, the ties between the university and the hospital. In terms of the town, um, there's, I mean, there's a town-gown tension in Ann Arbor as there is in every large university town. Um, you know, St. Joe's Hospital used to be right down the street. I'm pointing back there. It's now moved, moved further out, but I mean, it, was, it was literally a block or two from the university hospital and staffed primarily by people who trained at the University of Michigan. So in terms of the quality of care that was delivered, it was hard to argue that it was not the same because it was the same people who are giving the care there. Thank you. Um, and that, I think, will open it up to questions from either you all here or the internet. Will you have somebody with a microphone? Or Thank you very much for your talk. It's so interesting. Um, in the picture on the right, in the upper left-hand corner, we see the big, beautiful Mott Children's Hospital. Mm -hmm. And um, I think Everyone agrees it's a remarkable place. It's a point of pride for the university. I'm just wondering when did the university sort of plant a flag to say, we're going to do pediatric medicine? Um, why, why do we have a children's hospital? That's a really good question. And um, to give you a good answer to it, I'd have to go back to the book that we wrote because I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the, the, point, the point, though, is that the decisions like building a children's hospital are, are just like building a university hospital, have to, are, are thoughtful decisions that have, you have to make a decision that you're going to treat pediatrics differently. I mean, the, whole, the, the branching off of pediatrics from medicine and realizing that children are not just adults, they're not just adults but smaller, um, is a relatively recent phenomenon. Also important, and I touched briefly on philanthropy, but I should come back to it here, is the philanthropic uh, generosity of people uh, like Charles Mott and the Charles Mott Foundation uh, that helps support the building of that, of that hospital. I'm sorry I can't give you a better answer. The, the, the book has more. I just don't remember it all. <laughs> Uh, 
Hi, I'm Janet Turley. Um, I believe the pediatric department started about 1920, and Dr. Cowie was instrumental as one of the, as the first professor of pediatrics and communicable diseases. Yep. But I don't, but the hospital didn't start until considerably later, I think. Thank you, Dr. Howell, for a great talk. Um, describe a little bit about the primary resources or primary sources that are available in that very early time in which the thought of proposing a university hospital to come to fruition um, from its first conversation until it actually opened. What kind of sources are even available? Were there letters or legislative records or public debates? for example, that would still be in existence that could serve as a primary source for trying to figure out how within the span of less than 10 years at the you know sort of very slow rate that legislatures move, that they actually made such a pronounced um, allocation of assets to be able to make a hospital in under 10 years. Yeah, um, I think that the, the debates were more at the university level and the resources, again, I've turned to the Bentley and its representative several times, uh, is where you will go. There are the proceedings of the Board of Regents, and there are exhibits that go along with the proceedings of the Board of Regents, and there are the records of the medical school, uh, which are, for those of you that have never explored them, maybe you're a closet historian and you really would love it. I mean, I, I, I love looking at that material. It requires leafing through lots of pages because nobody's got an index that says, you know, well, the regents have the board of regents proceedings have an index. Those are those are the main sorts of sources. Um, if you wanted to look, for example, at the building of the replacement hospital that I mentioned, there there are thirty or forty linear feet of material, and you have the opposite problem, which is you have so much material that it's hard to come to grips with. But there were some very interesting decisions made about what kind of hospital we were going to build. And you could make the same argument about the building of the new pavilion hospital, which is not, not yet open. A sidebar to the building of Old Main is that it was actually shut down because of pandemic. When the influenza pandemic came down, we ran out of money and they shuttered it up. What happened when we were building the new pavilion hospital during COVID? We, 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 uh, we shuttered it up because we're in the middle of a pandemic. So both, both of them had their building uh, interrupted um, because of economic uh, consequences secondary to pandemics. Joel, thank you. I thought it was a great talk. Thank you so much. This is the man that originally invited me, so it's his fault. If you, <laughs> it's my fault. If you, if you didn't like yeah, the well, talk, was, go talk to him. It was wonderful. <laughs> Uh, so I have an observation which you can comment on or not, and also a question. I mean, the observation is when you were talking about the homeopathic hospital and you talked about uh, homeopathy being kind of this Midwestern homegrown thing, and this is kind of part of the early history of the university, right, is this kind of uh, uh, tension between leaning toward the East Coast and the international and staying, you know, close to home. So that's the observation. So let's, let me just yeah. let you respond to this. There's another subtext to that that I didn't say, which is religion. Because the East Coast has the tinge of Judaism. These are Jews who have these ideas. And, and many of the original pioneers were, in fact, Jewish. Um, and that, and as opposed to a good Christian set of ideas. Um, that, would you agree? I mean, you've studied, you've studied this as much as I have. No, so. I agree. I think, that's, I think that's great. I think that's, I think that's exactly right. The, the question is, I thought, you, did, I, I thought you, you, you said very well what it means to have a hospital be part of a university. But I know that, I mean, you have appointments not just in the medical school, but in LSA, right? And uh, what does it mean to a university to have a hospital be part of it? Oh, God. Is it, is it, I think that both sides have enormous abilities to gain from interaction one with the other. So uh, a university teaches and does research. And it teaches, and, and we teach about things like the human condition. Uh, 
we're all going to get sick and we're all going to die. Sorry for those younger people in the audience, but it's true. Um, that's part of life. And so one of the things I do in this medical arts program is have people, writers from the Zell program, sit down with poets from the medical school and interact and learn you know, from, each, from each other. Um, scientific research, many of the questions come out of clinical care. And so, you know, we have a lot of basic science that goes on in, L in LSA, in the engineering school, in the School of Public Health, and others. So it informs what, what they do. It, uh, it also informs a certain element of realpolitik. I mean, we spend 17% 17, 17 of our GDP on health care. 17%. Go back and look at the history, you can see in the 1990s we were spending 10%, and Everybody said, this is unsustainable. We can't possibly spend this much where we went up. It would be one thing if, for 17% of our GDP, we got health care that was better than anywhere else in the world. Um, on a good day, going downhill with the wind behind us, we're average, uh, as compared to other advanced industrialized countries. In many respects, we're below average. So we're spending a lot of money, and we're not getting superb care. Now, we could question, you know, if we were getting superb care, would it be worth it? But just as a thought experiment, uh, what could we do if we were spending 10% of our health, GDP on health care? What could we do with 7% of the GDP that suddenly became available? How many bridges could we build? How many preschools could we build? Uh, you know, what could we do with the infrastructure that we so desperately need our help? That's part of what the, it's the university's mission to study. And in, in departments of economics, in departments of sociology, in departments of anthropology, and to have a medical school where you can actually interact and, and pick apart, I mean, I've made some very broad generalizations there. You know, precisely what part of that 17% is useful and what part is useless. That would be very nice to know that. Well, I mean, part of that you're going to have to, you're going to go to the healthcare system and, and study it there. So I, th I think that it's, it's valuable both for teaching and for research in, in, in going in both directions. And one of the huge advantages we have here is the physical proximity. Uh, the aforementioned Johns Hopkins is six miles between the medical center. Um, Harvard, you've got to go between Cambridge and Boston. Cornell, you've got to go from Ithaca to New York City. Um, UCSF, if you, th you know, if you believe that, I mean, maybe, maybe Berkeley is the sister university. Uh, when I was looking at a job at UCSF, they lied to me and said it was 40 minutes from one to the other. Um, it is 40 minutes if it's 2 in the morning and you don't mind speeding. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, obviously, you could walk out this door and you can be in the hospital in 2 or 3 minutes and be in central campus in 4 or 5 minutes walking. That means that people, not just me, but there's lots of us, can walk back and forth. And that really has given us an, an enormous advantage. I don't know if that's answering your question or not. Maybe the chat. We have a question from Fred Begel about uh, Christopher Parnell, Dr. Christopher Parnell, and his input on the original construction and design by Khan of the Old Main Hospital. I will plead ignorance. I do not know. How's that for a short, simple answer? <laughs> Maybe somebody over here does know. Maybe that'd be great. I was just going to say, what happened to the facade of Old Main that was allegedly put into a warehouse? and was going to appear on campus at some point in the future. First of all, is it still in a warehouse? And is it ever going to show up again? <laughs> OK, this, this goes well beyond my pay grade to answer. <laughs> um, I will tell you that there was enormous controversy, as you may be aware, at the time. I had medical students who wanted to argue for its preservation and wanted to meet with the then president of the university, who refused to meet with them. They said they would ride in a car as he went from one appointment to another and talk to him there so that it wouldn't cost him any time. That didn't work, and it went away. And Gary, as someone who has had some contacts with these higher levels, do you have any idea what the answer to that question is? Well, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. The status of it. I assume it's still, it's still out there. <laughs> there, was a, there was a plan at one Out to be a much more expensive plan than 
for some reason, I can't help but think about the banners from the Fab Five's NCAA forays, which were taken down and reside at the Bentley. Uh, so I don't know. Maybe maybe it's at maybe it's at the Bentley, but it's <laughs> we we'll have to check with them. You had mentioned the uh, problem of lack of patients in Ann Arbor. When the new hospitals built, huge hospital in 1925, where did these patients come from? They came from all over the state. And a lot of things are happening there. One thing, Ann Arbor's getting bigger. Uh, Detroit's getting much bigger. I mean, Detroit's, in 1925, Detroit is on its way to becoming you know, a, a dominant American city. Uh, and the other thing, I, I love transportation. I'll just point out that transportation is becoming much more feasible in 1925 than it was in 1860. I mean, for one thing, the automobile is coming into common practice. So it's easier to get people back and forth. Um, you probably could find out exactly where they were coming from. I haven't done that analysis. Thank you. Hmm. Uh, Dr. Howell, thank you very much. Sure. Uh, great, great, great speech, great talk. Um, my question is, goes a little bit back to some of the purse strings that you mentioned. You were talking about the, uh, um, the, the cost of health care. Um, I found it a little interesting that the legislature was willing to give up administrative control to a board of regents, even though the legislature was supplying the money. How did that come about for the university? I, I find that very interesting that they were willing to give up control of the money. That goes back, I believe, to 1837, uh, and there's not as, in 1837 there is no university hospital and nobody's even talking about a university hospital. Um, and there's, there's less money involved and you've got, a, you know, a, a brand new state that, you know, wasn't a state in 1836. Um, so I, I don't know that they talked about the money side of that. I would have to look into that. If anybody in the room does know the answer to that question, um, I keep looking back at Gary. Is that? <laughs> as, as far as I know, money didn't really enter into it at that point. Yeah. Well, to go back to some of the slides I've showed, money doesn't play that important a role in hospitals. I mean, the, the reason that a journal like Hospital Management puts on its cover a slide that says you need good accountants is because that's new. I mean, if, if, if money had been a big part of the hospital for a long time, there would be no need to emphasize it. I mean, nowadays we don't say, you know, hey, I got a great idea, we need to, we need to get some good accountants to run the hospital. Um, the earlier hospitals, there was no technology, there were no x-rays, there's no electrocardiogram. Most of the expenses were the expenses of a boarding house. Food, water, heat. Um, and so it just was it, it was, it was less of a role. I mean, then you have things like the x-ray. And the, the x-ray is very expensive. Um, and you have the invention of things like cost accounting, which, believe it or not, is a fascinating topic. Um, cost accounting, which relies on technology. So cost accounting says, say we got this new x-ray machine, and we, built, we, built, we bought an x-ray machine, and we hired somebody to run it, and we charged people money for the x-rays. At the end of the year, was that a good idea? Um, this comes out of the railroads, and it comes out of new technology. The railroads, you've got Ann Arbor running a line between Detroit and Chicago. Ann Arbor says, let's run a line down to Toledo, and at the end of the year, was that a good idea? Well, you need, the idea of cost accounting is let's disaggregate the costs. How much money went to that new addition? Now, if you're doing that with pencil and paper, it's hard, but there's the invention of re recording adding machines, so you can run the numbers. And they do that with the and they do that with X-rays um, to figure out if they're making money off the X-ray machine. Um, this would have been totally out of the range of even conceptualizing in 1830 or even 1840 or 1850 or 1860. They they, they just weren't thinking that way. I think we have another. Online. Uh, this might be a question for both of you. Uh, Yolanda Perkham asks, are patient records kept at the Bentley? And they might be very useful to people researching their family history. Oh, that's an excellent question. I, th there's a book I wrote called Technology in the Hospital that explores the use of technology in hospitals. So what I just told you is a riff off a chapter of that book. <laughs> um, 
And to write that, I needed to go find patient records from the early 20th century. Uh, and I could not find the records for the University of Michigan Hospital. Many places, including, and you, and you can, I hope you will jump in in the pine, um, places like the Bentley do not want to keep patient records. They want to stay away. They claim it's because issues of confidentiality. I'm not sure that from 100 years ago that that's that important. Uh, they also claim that it's for cost and expense, and they're certainly right there because patient records are bulky and hard to maintain. So it was hard to find the records. I found them at the New York Hospital and at the Pennsylvania Hospital. Um, what you want, if you really want to study the delivery of health care, you need the complete run of records. You, you, what a lot of people have done, which is fairly limited, is to rely on what's published in medical journals. So who was the first person to publish an x-ray showing this diagnosis? That doesn't help you much for knowing what patient care is all about. What you need is the complete set of records. And you can explain to me why the Bentley doesn't do that. Uh, well, privacy concerns are the biggest one. Um, and the cost is definitely a big factor. Um, and so really, we do not have any patient records. Uh, and if we do, uh, I please, if you find them, if you come to the Bentley to do some research, please let us know so we can remove them. <laughs> um, because we do not want those. <laughs> One final question. I, I just had a comment about the uh, patient records uh, question. Um, Dr. Howell, have you ever seen published in the uh, region's proceedings um, charts, uh, tables, tabular information about um, statistics about the results of an admission of a patient, what operation was done, and then was, what was the outcome? Were they cured? Um, were they, was there no change, or, or was there a fatal outcome, uh, and so on. I have seen, I've seen that kind of record. Um, so that, that does exist somewhere. And also, we have to remember, before Old Main, the records were kept in a, a journal by Ward, and the, there were no individual patient records kept at that time. The, each patient had a, a line entry in um, a page in a, in a ward book when they came in, what was done to them, and what operation they had, and what diagnosis they had. Yeah. That's absolutely right. Um, the aforementioned book, it's called Technology in the Hospital, Johns Hopkins University Press. You're all going to want about two or three copies of it. Um, I talk about the changes in patient records, and I specifically talk about precisely what, you're, what you were describing, which is the change from a very, very brief, patients would stay for three months and there will be one page. Um, that, you know, and, and the explosion of records that we're all familiar with, although now with them becoming electronic, it's, the physical metaphor has started to be diluted to a certain extent. And what's interesting is why we see that explosion um, of information, and a lot has to do with the use of technology and the use of science and the idea that somehow tracking somebody's blood count every day over three months will, is, is, is worth doing. Uh, as you said, the, um, previous to that, there would be one line, you know, age, diagnosis, and either cured, improved, or, or not. You can get a lot out of those records um, it's more difficult to really understand what's going on, obviously. Uh, did they get an x-ray or not? Um, that's, for that, you, you need, you need some, to go somewhat deeper. All right. All right. Well, on that note, uh, thank you, Joel, for that wonderful talk. Uh, thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, thanks as well to Austin Edminster for monitoring the live stream comments and to the wonderful Michigan media team who made us you know, audible to everybody. Um, for those of you who are here with us in person, uh, we're going to open the original observatory. If you want to see some fascinating exhibits about its history, uh, maybe do so. Are we doing viewing tonight? The clouds have been hit or miss, so we'll try. Okay, you'll, you'll get a chance potentially to look through the original 1850s telescope. Um, for those of you who are online, hope you come join us soon. We're open every Friday, both in the afternoons and in the evenings. Um, and 
On that note, I just want to say thank you again for joining us, and have a wonderful evening. That was really fantastic.